Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Khalil Jahshan. I'm executive director of Arab Center, Washington, D.C. And I would like to welcome uh, all of you to this uh, special uh, briefing uh, focusing on the shakeup in uh, Riyadh regional and international implications. Over the past uh, 12, 13 days, uh, since I guess uh, the 4th or the 5th of uh, November, uh, some serious and very significant uh, changes uh, and steps have been taken in the Kingdom of uh, Saudi Arabia that attracted uh, the attention uh, of media and, and uh, political analysts all over the world, as a matter of fact. And uh, as all of you know, there has been hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, articles and interviews uh, conducted, written, uh, about the significance uh, of these uh, events uh, in terms of uh, immediate, mid-term, long-term uh, implications, domestic uh, uh, implications, regional implications, international implications uh, for the kingdom and for those, uh, of course, like the United States, uh, countries that have extensive interest and special relationship uh, with uh, the kingdom. Uh, although it's been a couple of weeks of, of hyperactivity at that level, analysis and reporting, frankly, more questions have been raised than answered uh, during uh, this uh, period. Uh, I don't need to uh, read you the titles of some of, the, uh, of all these questions because that will keep us here till next Friday. But I will raise uh, a couple of these questions just for the purpose and for the sake of the discussion today to kind of tend to frame, if you will, the conversation today. Some of the questions raised uh, starting early uh, November when these steps were uh, adopted or taken uh, included the following. What is the real meaning of the Saudi roundup that we witnessed on the 4th and the 5th of no November? Is it really an anti-corruption campaign or a consolidation of power campaign? Is Mohammed bin Salman behaving recklessly as claimed by an unnamed US diplomat? Or is he leading a genuine revolution from above in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? What are the domestic implications of this crack crackdown that we have witnessed over the past 12, 13 days? What is the impact specifically, domestically, on the governance process in general in Saudi Arabia, on the role of the royal family in power sharing in the kingdom, and particularly the role on, on, of the religious establishment? Are they marginalized with the arrest that we have witnessed even prior to the arrests of the princes and, and the businessmen? There was also a large uh, uh, number of uh, religious uh, establishment, ulama, and, and others uh, that has, have also been detained. Is, when we look back at this period, is power trumping legitimacy in Saudi Arabia? How is legitimacy going to be affected uh, by these steps? Is this the beginning, as one of my colleagues at the office said, is this the beginning of the fourth Saudi state? Uh, is the kingdom of Saudi Arabia transforming its ultra-conservative Salafi thought to moderate Salafism? Did the purge of Saudi billionaires and millionaires help or harm Vision 2030? Is this the Saudi Arabia that Saudi youth want? In other words, what's the domestic uh, reaction now and in the future uh, to, to this campaign. And definitely, we need to kind of touch on the what are the regional and international implications of this Saudi purge. To help us answer these questions, and, and uh, we invited two dear friends uh, who are well informed about these developments. Uh, and uh, those of you who have been following up uh, the reaction, whether on uh, Twitter or, or otherwise uh, have seen their very significant, their substantive, and their uh, uh, wise comments uh, that help kind of direct the conversation actually worldwide, not just uh, in Saudi Arabia or outside here in the States. Uh, let me introduce both of them at this time in the order they will speak. 
and then we'll uh, give them uh, the floor to proceed. The first speaker would be uh, Jamal Khashoggi. Jamal uh, is a Saudi Arabian uh, journalist, columnist, author, editor. He doesn't need an introduction to those of you who are in the media and have been following uh, the Middle East or the Arabic language media. He served as correspondent for several, both Arabic and English language publications, including uh, the Saudi Gazette, al Sharq al Awsat, Al Majalla, Al Hayat, was the editor in chief of Al, al Watan was the deputy editor-in-chief of Arab News, and on and on and on with regards. Uh, so he's been a key figure uh, in the uh, media in the Middle East, not just in uh, Saudi Arabia. He was actually uh, earlier in his career, and our friendship goes back to more than uh, 25 years, actually. Uh, he served as a correspondent, foreign correspondent, in different countries in the region, including Algeria, Afghanistan, Lebanon, uh, Kuwait and, and the Sudan, and reported on all these developments during that period in the region and became thus an expert, particularly with the rise of Islamism uh, in the region. He became uh, a well-known uh, expert on this uh, issue. He worked here in, uh, in Washington for a while, was a consultant, media consultant to the embassy of Saudi Arabia, particularly with the uh, uh, when Prince Turkil Faisal was the ambassador during that, uh, that period. But he has always been uh, also a commentator uh, on the media, as I said, in all these languages and many networks aside the, the, uh, the, the Saudi ones that he directed or worked at, uh, and that includes channels like BBC, Al Jazeera, NBC, Dubai TV, and many uh, others. Our next speaker, also good friend, uh, Christian Coates Eriksson. Uh, he is the uh, uh, Middle East Fellow at uh, the Baker Institute for Public Policy uh, at Rice University. And we're also delighted that uh, he chose to uh, make the trip from Houston uh, last night uh, to be with us uh, today. Christian uh, is uh, working at the uh, Baker Institute uh, across the disciplines of uh, political science, international relations, international political economy. Uh, his research, for those of you who are not familiar with his research, look him up, examines the changing position of Gulf uh, states in the global order, which is certainly very relevant to the developments that we are examining uh, today. Uh, he also has focused on the emergence of longer term non-military challenges in regional security in the Gulf uh, region. He worked uh, before that as a senior Gulf analyst at the Gulf Center for Strategic Studies between 2006 and 2008, and as co-director of the Kuwait Program on Development, Governance, and Globalization in the Gulf States at the London School of Economics between 2008 and 2013. He holds a doctorate in history uh, from the University uh, of uh, Cambridge. Uh, each uh, speaker will uh, speak for um, 12 to 15 minutes, and then we will spend the balance of our time engaging in the art of conversation, uh, giving you a chance to engage directly uh, with the speakers uh, through your questions. Uh, I would just like to remind you uh, that the cards and the little pencils uh, on your seat are not to improve your seating. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they are meant for you to uh, uh, basically uh, write your questions. We only entertain questions in writing. Uh, once you have a question or a comment, just raise your card. Staff will pick it up from you and will be more than glad uh, to uh, read and direct your questions to the right speaker or uh, to both. Uh, please uh, write legibly if you'd like for me uh, to read exactly what you have written. and. Uh, Make it short so that we can accommodate as many questions uh, as possible. Uh, at the front desk, uh, we had a copy. Uh, I don't know if we have enough copies for everybody today, but we do have a copy of one of our lead, uh, most recent uh, reports. Uh, this report was based actually on the agenda of our second annual conference that we just held a few weeks ago. It's about Trump and the Arab world, and it's definitely relevant. It's written by our staff, uh, our analysts, and uh, it's available for you at the front desk on your way back. If, if we are out of copies, 
uh, feel free to give us a call at the uh, center, and we will be more than glad uh, to send you uh, a copy. At this time, I would like to uh, invite uh, Jamal uh, to the podium, please. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. Thank you all for coming. In, uh, in my career as a journalist, an editor, I called for everything Mohammed bin Salman is doing right now. I am, not only me, every other Saudi writers, commentator, we all wanted us to be free from radicalism. We all wanted women to be allowed to have their rights to drive. And we all wanted Burj on corruption, because corruption was killing us in Saudi Arabia, and we the Saud. And, and corruption is no secret in Saudi Arabia. We feel it. We see it every day. But we just simply cannot report about it. So he is doing what we demanded of him to do. So why am I being critical? Simply because he is doing the right things the wrong way, very wrong way. And. Uh, I will explain why in a number of points that Khalil has uh, thrown around to us. For example, on the Belgian corruption. I think the Saudi people are very much supportive of it. Right now in Saudi Arabia, we are going through some kind of euphoria that people don't think, don't question, media don't discuss the impact of uh, such decisions. For two reasons, it is this euphoria and also for government control. There are people who, we, who were called to the state security to sign pledges not to criticize the government. So they chose to stay in their homes. Others were arrested. So when somebody, when a writer is, is arrested, everything other writers are afraid to speak because they don't want to be arrested. So the environment in Saudi Arabia does not allow for constructive criticism or constructive debate and discourse about Lively matter, matter that they are going to affect us for the future. That is one thing. The other thing, it is also the, euph the euphoria. The government is feeding into the people high expectation, promises. And I, I would say most of the young people don't want to listen to somebody who would disappoint them with bad news. But here in Washington, we can discuss the bad news. And probably it will find its way through the, the ears of the Saudis. And if, for example, Belgian corruption. Yes, we, the people of Saudi Arabia, should own it. It is not, despite what, what could be the true motive of Mohammed bin Salman, whether it is power play or a true genuine fight against corruption. We, the people of Saudi Arabia, need to own the Belgian corruption because it is the only thing for us to dry, uh, to, 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 uh, to move into the future. This vision 2030 of his cannot never succeed without a true fight on corruption. So I will not spend much of time as a Saudi free writer uh, speculating why is he after corruption. I, I, will, I, will, I will announce my support, and I, and I already did that in Twitter. I said I support Mohammed bin Salman in his fight on corruption, and I think every other Saudi should support uh, him in that. But at the same time, I would like to see a debate about that. Uh, the fight on corruption is going to have a major effect on Saudi Arabia. It could be a power, a power, a power play, but we, we, we will come to that later. It is going to have an immediate effect on the economy. The private sector is panicking right, right now in Saudi Arabia. People are worried whether they will be paid at the end of the month in large corporations, like the Bin Laden company, like Dalal Baraka company. And we are talking about, in Dalal Baraka, they have about 140,000 employees. That's a huge number. And with Sheikh Saleh Kamil and all of his sons are in, uh, are in the Ritz Carlton, maybe there is no one to sign the checks at the end of the month. Uh, maybe the government is going to sort that out. But I'm sure the private sector in Saudi Arabia is panicking. But in the long term, it is good. If this drive against corruption will succeed and it will free Saudi Arabia from uh, the, the epidemic of corruption, it could lead to a proper economy. It, it, it would lead to 
uh, elevating of a new middle class in Saudi Arabia. But I think he has to distinguish between the royal wealth and the corporation wealth. The royals are the reason for corruption. They are the one who inflated the price of the contracts. They are the one who made it impossible for even good business to, to, to work and flourish in Saudi Arabia. Their cuts are not 5%. Their cuts is in billions. It, corruption in Saudi Arabia, it is not a gold necklace that you pass to the, the Congress uh, wife or uh, a governor. Or We are talking about a project that costs a billion, and the value of it will increase to three billions just so his royal highness will take a cut and his brother will take another cut. That, of course, it, it will deplete the Saudi national budget. It will, and according to Mohammed bin Salman himself, in an interview he made with Bloomberg last April, uh, April 2016, he said in the years from 2010 to 2014, a hundred billion dollars every year were wasted in what he described inefficient spending. That is corruption. So we are talking about $400 billion in only four years. So if that is the case for a whole decade or two decades, we are talking about a trillion dollars. That may be 30% of the Saudi national budget. In America, you call that your taxpayer money. It is our money. It is our, it is our money, it is the Saudi people. 30% of it went away in lavish houses in Los Angeles and uh, hotels in, uh, in Paris and, and under the name of Royal Highness. And it is good Mohammed bin Salman is after that. He need to reclaim that money back and stop this, uh, th this habit. But at the same time, what about the corporations? Those, those are national corporations. They need to be preserved. Like the Bin Laden, like the Dal uh, Baraka, Al Jurasi, others, others, others. There are many corporations. They are, they are banking, they are worried. The, the, the Jaffalis. I wish he would do something like what you do here in America, uh, the IRS, when they suspect uh, a misdealing of a corporation, they will go to the company, they will check their books, they will uh, uh, argue with them, fight with them, uh, and end up with the settlement where uh, the company will be a few billions or 20%, 50%, 60%, but something transparent, something clear, but not to destroy those companies. Destroying those companies, it will have a major impact on Saudi Arabia. Another important thing we, we might lose because of that, it is trust. If the Saudi investors lose trust, and again, just a week ago or 10 days ago, he was, uh, uh, MBS had a huge conference in Riyadh where he uh, was introducing Saudi Arabia to the world as uh, a haven or an opportunity for investors. I'm sure. Foreigners who attended that conference are having second thoughts today. Trust is important. When Jamal Abdel Nasser nationalized businesses in Egypt in the 60s and in Syria, it took the Egyptians and the Syrians generation to regain the trust to in reinvest back in their country. I wish some advisor will tell that in Mohammed bin Salman. Trust is important, and he is, by, by what, what he's doing, is killing trust. There are important stories that are being published in in the Financial Times today, and there is no comments from Saudi Arabia, from the Saudi uh, Minister of, uh, of Finance, of Trade, of uh, MBS himself. When the Financial Times ran in his front page a story about that uh, the government is negotiating with the business uh, community and wealthy and uh, princes to take 70% of their wealth for a settlement, and there is no comment from the Saudi government about it, that is worrying. Is it power consolidation or real reform? It has to be seen. We don't know yet. Is, it going, is he going, to, going Chinese style where he will clean the house and restart the business in a clean uh, ground? Or is it a Putin style where he will collect all the wealth and he will sit on it? And he will be the master of everything and he will uh, use the money to make our life, to make Saudi Arabia great again. Of course, 
I don't personally like the Putin style. I would like the Chinese style. But if we could have a democratic style, that would be much better. But you see, as, as a citizen of Saudi Arabia, I don't have much, much choices. Mohammed bin Salman has won. And he is going to be the leader of Saudi Arabia uh, for maybe another 50 years. He's young, and considering the age factor and uh, advancement of medicine, maybe he will make it even more than 60, uh, 50 years. So we just the only thing we could do as Saudi Arabians is just to hope he will succeed. His success is, will be our success, not necessarily me. I made it in my life, but for my kids and my grandkids. Uh, can he succeed? Can Saudi Arabia in 10 years? How do I see it in 10 years? Um, I will, uh, Saudi Arabia will be a great success of Mohammed bin Salman succeeded in fixing the epidemic of unemployment. It is the, it is the most serious thing going to face him. It is, the other serious thing is his high expectation. He rose expectation to the people. He made the young people reach the sky. And five years' time, the people are going to demand. And they want to see this futuristic city in the north, this uh, Red Sea Islands in the, uh, also in the, in the north of my hometown, Medina. So he has to, to show them what he had promised. But the most important thing he has to fulfill is unemployment. And we are talking about 4 million people unemployment in Saudi Arabia and 250,000 people every year in an economy that is controlled by foreign labor. The British exited Europe because of 8.9% of foreigners in their workforce. It is 75% to 70 to percent to 75 uh, of foreigners who control our workforce in Saudi Arabia. That is not a very, that is not a natural, that is not a very ordinary economy. Our economy needs to be restructured, and I wish Mohammed bin Salman will, will work from uh, the bottom up and fix the economy before he uh, built new cities. But if he gonna insist in his style of building from the top down, building new cities, I will, forecast bankruptcy for Saudi Arabia, God forbid. I hope not. I hope he will change course, and he will go to the basic economy, economy 101, and start with the people jobs, rather than building new cities. Already he has in front of his, of, of, of his eyes right now two failed cities that need, to, uh, that need to work. King Abdullah financial city in Riyadh. I'm sure any one of you who went to Riyadh in, in your way to, the, to your hotel, you will see that beautiful city that looked like another Dubai uh, in the middle of Riyadh. Not a single office was uh, rented at that city. And uh, basically, the city of Riyadh doesn't need it. Now he has to find a solution for it. The other city is King Abdullah city in the, in, in the west coast. It is partially working, not fully working, and it needs to work. So building new cities is not the solution. Finding jobs to the Saudi people through jobs is a solution, and I hope he will spend more time at that. I, I, I think I ran out of my time before discussing foreign policy, but that is a big problem by itself. And, uh, and there's a, a hasty style that is firing back on us in Saudi Arabia, and unfortunately empowering the Iranians. For every misstep we make, the Iranians gain. Saudi Arabia is uh, the pillar of stability in the region, and it is the pillar for the Sunni world. We, the Sunni, are, we are the majority Sunni are being victimized. We are under the threat by the Shia minority today. Most of the killing, it is happening in our territories, in our land, and Saudi Arabia should be there to, uh, to counter the Iranian expansionism, but Saudi Arabia is obsessed with its fight against political Islam, while it is the mother and father of political Islam. Saudi Arabia should need to change its priority and adapt again its origin, its uh, traditions, go back to it without radicalism, and uh, stand up for Iran, Iranian ex expansionism, because what that is what is threatening us, we the Sunnis of the Arab world. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Jamal. And now for our second uh, speaker, Christian Eriksson. Thank you very much, uh, Khalil, for the introduction and for the invitation. I will not reiterate what Jamal Khashoggi has said, but I'll just add my own thoughts on some of the changes we have seen, which have been interpreted, as has been said, as varying degrees of power plays or of the sweeping away of the new, of the old Saudi state. Again, I think it's too early to tell. What I would just say would be that I think the Saudi Arabia we have known since 1953 that came into being after the death of King Abdulaziz has, or is slipping away, and we are seeing really the passing of the old guard. And the passing of the old guard in part because of natural causes. Over the past seven years, some of the key figures in the old guard have passed away. Uh, Crown Prince Sultan died in 2011. He had been defense minister for 48 years. Crown Prince Nayef died in 2012. He had been interior minister for 37 years. Saud al Faisal died in 2015. He had been foreign minister for 40 years. And of course, King Abdullah also passed away in 2015. And in addition to his duties as king and previously as crown prince, he had also headed the National Guard for, again, a period of 48 years. So more by accident than by design, the old guard had passed from the scene. And a lot of the commentary over the past 10 days has also focused on the apparent uh, sweeping away of the checks and balances that have, again, been said to traditionally kind of be a feature of Saudi policy making. And it's true that in the past, one has had four or five competing factions within the royal family competing for influence and ensuring that key decisions have had to have been taken with a degree of consensus that in some cases has meant that policy making was slow, but it did involve all wings of the, of the family and of society. And again, there was nothing constitutionally mandated. There's no separation of powers in a formal sense that we would have here in the US or in other countries. This system of checks and balances to the extent that it was one arose again more by accident in the sense that you would had those powerful figures within the royal family remaining in position for decades and creating these networks of power that was impossible to ignore. So again, the, the kind of removal of the checks and balances has happened. It happened before King Salman came to power. And of course, it has been the King and Mohammed bin Salman's inheritance that they've been able to, I suppose, not necessarily take advantage, but move into this new dynamic where a lot of the old constraints no longer exist. So a power grab, not to the extent that has been described in the media. To the extent that there was a power grab, it occurred between January 2015 and June 2017, and it really ended when Mohammed bin Salman became Crown Prince. We should all take note as people who observe Saudi Arabia that five years ago we were all engaged in guessing who might be the next generation of leadership. And I think nobody would have even put Mohammed bin Salman on the horizon at that time. So we, you know, we, we have a lesson in humility there. But to the extent that a power grab has occurred, it's you know, finished. And we can obviously see that Mohammed bin Salman is now engaged in in remaking to a degree the Saudi Arabia that he intends to rule, as Jamal said, for another 50 years if, if, if things go well. We're seeing the, uh, you know, the, the passing of the old guards in an accelerated way. Those who have not passed away are now being eased out of positions. We're seeing Mohammed bin Salman putting his own people, often from his own generation, in charge and trying to recreate some of those networks that has uh, that has uh, that he's um, tried to uh, obliterate um, from the from the older generation. 
Another issue we've seen a lot about is that is popular among the youth, and I would agree that tackling corruption is a popular or perhaps a populist issue in the sense that many young people in Saudi Arabia who might feel cut out of being given a fair chance or feel that they don't have a, a prospect of getting a, 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 a decent job because of various issues, some of which might be vested economic and political issues, will probably support the, the, um, the changes. What I would say, of course, is that there's no way of really knowing, in a sense that there are no real opinion polls. We don't know to what extent these uh, decisions are popular or not. And clearly, the educated elites who have studied in Western universities and gone back, and who perhaps are more vocal in uh, proclaiming the magnitude of these changes, are only one part of the whole bigger picture. You know, there are a lot of people in other parts of Saudi Arabia who may not see a trickle-down effect. And I think it's absolutely vital that we would not lose sight. We don't focus too closely on just the kind of the elites in Riyadh or in other major cities. And Saudi Arabia has always been much more than that. I do share the concern that Jamal raised about raising expectations. And I think this is a key problem or key challenge that he, Mohammed bin Salman has, is now facing with his Vision 2030 and his National Transformation Plan and the promise that the Saudi Arabia in the future will be a, a, a more fluid and dynamic Saudi Arabia, he has now to deliver. And I think even very early signs after just a couple of years are that the changing, transforming a vision into reality is proving much more difficult in practice. And it will inherently involve taking on a degree of not just vested interest, but structural obstacles in the Saudi economy that I think will require more than just a plan that was um, uh, cooked up in Western consultancies. And so far, at least, I think the initial expectations have had to be have had to have been tempered perhaps because some of the expectations were so far fetched at the beginning the challenge for Mohammed bin Salman is that he is 32 and he owns this process if he gets it right he will secure his kingdom unlike previous kings for the last 20 years or so who have been in their 70s 80s and even in their 90s he, Mohammed bin Salman, will be the one who has to face the day of reckoning in 20, 30, 40 years, either when Saudi Arabia faces economic and structural challenges that can no longer be ignored, or when, for example, domestic energy consumption, which is increasing so rapidly, means that so much energy has to be consumed locally that it can no longer export six or seven million barrels of oil per day. So Mohammed bin Salman owns this process in a way that none of his predecessors really have. It's not something that can be kicked down the road for a future king, because if he gets it wrong, he could put in peril his entire, his entire inheritance. And so that's also, I think, what explains perhaps some of the, the scale of the, the actions that he's been taking, and perhaps some of the urgency that we have seen but it's clearly a high risk uh, it's a high risk bet and if it goes wrong it could go very badly wrong indeed from what i can tell a lot of the messaging that has accompanied vision 2030 over the past 2 years has been aimed much more at the international investor community and not necessarily so much at saudis who are still looking for the sort of basic improvement in their daily or kind of life prospects. And I think we saw that on full show, not just in the Future Investment Initiative that took place in Riyadh three weeks ago, but even this week when we had the MISC Global Forum with uh, Bill Gates as one of its key, key speakers. Mohammed bin Salman is trying to pitch a, a new Saudi Arabia to the international community. And to some extent, he's been quite successful so my concern is that the actions over the past two weeks just reinforce the stereotype, stereotyped view of the kingdom that people from the outside may just hold of it. And so that makes me wonder what 
may have happened behind the scenes to explain the timing of this action. I mean, is it just a, a miscalculation in the sense that Mohammed bin Salman and his team may have thought that sending a tough message on corruption would entice international investors by promising that the new Saudi Arabia is a much freer place to do business in, because if that was the case, that wasn't the message that has necessarily been received internationally. Although one might add that both the military operations in Yemen and the uh, trade and diplomatic embargo of Qatar would show that miscalculations have been happening and that uh, long-term strategic thinking definitely needs, I think, to be, to be improved. So I think this top-down leadership and the decision to focus on the international rather than perhaps the domestic audience is something that needs to change. I think that sooner rather than later, the Crown Prince and his team will have to begin to show meaningful results that can convince Saudis of all um, parts of the kingdom that their own lives are going to be transformed for the better. And this, I think, is going to be the yardstick by which Mohammed bin Salman will be judged. And again, over the next decades, this will probably determine whether the new Saudi state, the fourth state, or whatever we would call it, is more sustainable in the long run than the one that we are seeing swept, being swept away before our eyes. I'd maybe just end by saying that this is indeed a, a moment of transformation in the sense that you know, the institutional structures that for decades we thought were kind of solidified because they were so entrenched are now suddenly in place. So there is a moment to try and remake institutions and clearly recreate leadership structures. And I think it would be fascinating, we won't know the answer to this, of course, but it would be fascinating to see if this moment of change also solidifies as its predecessor has done in the 1950s and 60s into another kind of stasis that maybe prohibits change down the line. Um, there was a lot of talk about uh, Mohammed bin Salman becoming defense minister at the age of 29. But of course, we shouldn't forget that uh, Prince Sultan became defense minister when he was 32. And he died at defense minister at the age of 80. So this system has opened up, perhaps contrary to the expectations of a lot of analysts. But it's opened up because of a sequence of events that were not necessarily coordinated. But the key interest, I think, going forward is, is it going to close around Mohammed bin Salman and be just as perhaps impenetrable to long-term change as the past has been as well? So with that, I'll, uh, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you. All right, if you still have any uh, questions, please go ahead and uh, just raise your card, and staff will pick it up from you and bring it over here. Let me uh, start reading your questions. Uh, the first question is from Mohammed Shinawi, Voice of America. Prominent business persons are among detainees in, the Saudi, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, $100 billion corruption crackdown. They have invested billions of dollars in economic and agricultural projects in North and East Africa. How would the crackdown affect such projects globally? Jamal, would you like to write it? It will. It has. Uh, actually, twice I come across this question from an Uber driver. Are the microphones on? OK, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, who happen to be from Ethiopia. And they both uh, noticed that I'm from Saudi Arabia. I was talking on the phone to, some, to someone. And, and then they began having this, a, a conversation with me about Hassan al Amudi. Hussein al Amoudi has about 40,000 employees in Ethiopia. And I'm sure most of them are worried now whether they will be paid at the end of the month or not. He, uh, he has also huge business in, uh, in Morocco and in Sweden. Uh, and uh, we can start drawing a plan about others, about the Billadins, about uh, Saleh Kamil, and about the potentials. Uh, uh, who would, who would be added to the list of corruption. I just uh, heard a new name today from 
uh, a friend uh, in the audience, but I can, there is no way to confirm it. Uh, rumors are spreading like, like re really crazy in Saudi Arabia. And uh, in WhatsApp, I get all kind of uh, uh, news about uh, people added to the list. And unfortunately, corruption is, as I said, it's a way, it was a way of life. And, uh, and, it, and this is, and, and Mohammed bin Salman has now in his hand a magic stick. Uh, there is hardly could be a royal who isn't involved in some form of corruption. Corruption also need to be identified. What is corruption in Saudi Arabia? Is a land grant, a land grant corruption uh, or land grab is a corruption? Because royals are involved in both land grant by the king, which make it legal, even though we can argue about it Islamically, and land grab. Uh, and uh, so the stick of corruption is reachable to everybody. And that is scaring almost everyone uh, in Saudi Arabia and feel that I am next. And that, I'm sure, is going to have an impact on the society. The, 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 uh, the quick fixing for that is transparency. So far, our attorney general hasn't give, given a, uh, hasn't give a press conference. Mohammed bin Salman hasn't give an interview to anybody. There is need to do that. Someone, uh, 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 our attorney general need to do like, I think, a press conference every couple of days. It's a huge thing uh, that need more transparency. I think also the rule of, I think the due process and the rule of law will be absolutely vital as well. I mean, as, as you said, uh, establishing a new royal decree, by royal decree, a new commission headed by the crown prince who can almost define what corruption means to him isn't necessarily going to reassure international investors. Now, so I think the process will be very important, or lack of, in terms of whether or not investors are reassured or take fright. Yes. Uh, Lama from uh, Georgetown University. How do you propose uh, Mohammed bin Salman should address the Mus Muslim Brotherhood's uh, presence in the country? Either or, address to both. <laughs> Go ahead, you man. All right. I think the Muslim brothers are his natural allies. His, uh, Saudi Arabia is a revivalist Islam country, and he cannot run away from that. Yes, uh, uh, radicalism crept into Saudi Arabia uh, by untamed Wahhabis, whom King Abdul Aziz crushed in 1930, but they came back after 1979. But the Muslim, the Muslim Brotherhood provided the answer for modernity to King Faisal in the 1960s. They are a positive contribution to Saudi Arabia. And Mohammed bin Salman need to free himself from this unneeded paranoia of the Brotherhood and need to form an alliance with them to counter Iranian expansionism in the region. It's a total unneeded confrontation we are going through in Saudi Arabia. It is splitting the society, uh, and it is weakening Saudi Arabia. This is my blunt answer. Thank you. OK, this question is for you, Jamal, from uh, Mark Codell from Chevron. Uh, with reference to employing Saudi citizens, will Saudi families, Saudi society in general, Saudi culture, accept their sons and daughters working in blue-collar collar jobs? Yes. Economy ch will change habits. I think Karl Marx said that. Uh, we, the Saudis, used to do everything, to work on everything. I wrote a book about that. It is called Ihtilal al-Suq al-Saudi, the occupation of the Saudi market. And I told the stories about uh, my generation and my father's generation. My father was himself, uh, God bless his soul, he was a farmer. He, uh, he, he, used, to, he used to battle or, or he used to make dates in, 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 in containers. And that was a dirty, uh, it was kind of a, a, a hand job that get you dirty. Uh, so Saudi could do everything. In, in, with the first boom after 1973 war and uh, with, with, with the price of oil, uh, price of, uh, of, of oil doubling, uh, we had a huge boom. And we made the mistake of importing foreign laborers. And 
you can find quotation of Saudi official who said at that time, this is only temporary. The foreign labor, we need them to build the infrastructure, and they will eventually go. They never went. We become addicted to it. And that killed, that did not only take the jobs away, it killed the work ethics in us. It killed the work culture in us. Now we, the Saudis, think and we assume that we cannot do uh, work because we are addicted to it. This is the big task that Mohammed bin Salman need to work uh, on it. It's a social, political, economic task. He needs to, uh, he need to spend more time on it rather than uh, building a new city in the north. Thank you. Inas asks, this was not the first missile fired from the Houthis uh, on to, towards Saudi Arabian territory. So why was it so widely publicized this time? Well, I mean, I mean, absolutely right. It wasn't the first. It may have been the first that was targeting or at least landed in or around Riyadh or was intercepted around Riyadh. So it may have been taken as a much more, as much more of a direct strike at the heart of the Saudi, uh, Saudi system. I think the, the fact that you know, the war in Yemen is continuing is quite frankly not what was planned in 2015 when operations began. And every time a missile comes over, it's a signal from the Houthis and from uh, international backers that they, they retain the capacity to create embarrassment for the Saudi leadership. And that is, I think, something the Saudis are not yet, haven't yet figured out a way to try and resolve. I think the dilemma they have in Yemen is that decisive and overwhelming force to try and force the issue would be too much of a, a cost in terms of lives potentially lost and treasure lost. And so there's this sort of halfway house where they, you know, they're not willing to, or they're not necessarily going to back out, but they don't just really have the, the capacity to, to actually win. They want to add to that. Sure. Uh, also, there's something important about this missile. It is, uh, it's been proven by the Saudi investigation, and the Americans are backing that. It is an Iranian made, a Spurkan II missile that is recently introduced into the war front uh, that, the, that the Yemenis did not have before. The Yemenis keep uh, firing uh, old fashioned Scud missiles on, uh, on us. Uh, but this one is Iranians, which is a proof that the Iranians have succeeded despite the war in uh, sneaking in this missile into uh, Yemen territories, and maybe it was put together and by Yemenis or by Iranians or by Hezbollah operative. And that uh, is taken to Saudi Arabia as a game changer, that it is an act of war by the Iranians and Hezbollah and Saudi Arabia. And uh, it's, it's rightly so. I mean, the Iranians, if they had the opportunity to send tons of uh, Burkan missiles to Saudi Arabia, they would do it. They would, uh, so, 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 so that would enforce my argument that Saudi Arabia need to, to stand up to the Iranian expansionism, but it needs to do it the right way. And let's not forget that within two days of President Trump urging the Sunni Arab world to come together against Iran, the, Sunni, you know, the Saudis, Emiratis, and Bahrainis turned on Qatar, which I think was a strange way of trying to present a united front. OK, well, talking about Yemen, uh, when will the war in Yemen stop? If Prince Mohammed bin Salman read a little bit about what his uncle Faisal did in 1965. Uh, in 1965, King Faisal, who was supporting part of the Yemeni uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the civil war, uh, he distanced himself from all sides, and he played a broker of, to peace to all Yemenis. And ever since that time, Saudi Arabia become like an equal partner to all of Yemen. I think MBS need to rediscover that again and reach out to uh, Yemenis, whether they are Houthis or Islah. And he recently met with the Islah people in, in, in Riyadh. And that was very interesting, because the, supposedly the Ikhwan are in Saudi Arabia uh, terrorism list. And here he's meeting with the leader of the Ikhwan of, of, of Yemen, which is good. And it, it is ironic about listing the Ikhwan in the terrorist list because in Saudi Arabia, the, the Syrians Ikhwan are there. The chief of the Syrian Ikhwan is in Saudi Arabia. And the chief of Yemeni Ikhwan is in Saudi Arabia. I don't know about other Ikhwan. Maybe, uh, maybe they are also in Saudi Arabia. Uh, 
so that is the best way to end the war, is for Saudi Arabia to reach out to all Yemenis, not, uh, not favor one side against the other, just like how King Faisal did. That's exactly what King Faisal did in 1965 in Harad. The next question is from Les Janka. Uh, explain the dynamics of the royal family. Will its cohesion be threatened when King Salman passes away? Might Salman resign before that? Well, I think there's only one person who probably knows the answer to that question, and, and that's the king himself. I mean, we have a lot of speculation, clearly. And every time there's said to be an imminent abdication, it hasn't come to pass. One can read whatever one wants into that. Is there more domestic pushback than as anticipated? I guess we, we, we don't know. In terms of family dynamics, my concern perhaps is that Salman has for a long time in the past performed the role of almost like a chief whip of the family. He sort of kept, he was instrumental in maintaining family discipline. And you know, he was not just feared, but also respected for that. And it, it looks as if, at least to some extent, Mohammed bin Salman is trying to take on that mantle of also being the sort of family enforcer. But you know, will he have the gravitas, the seniority, to also make, kind of impose the respect on all the different branches that may now, to some extent, feel like they have less of a stake in the Saudi Arabia that they see coming together? And so what, it's, it's an open question whether once Salman has passed away, does the glue that has kept the family together begin to become a little weaker? And again, that's something we won't necessarily know. I, I, I want to add to that that I agree, I agree with Christian. And I will add that uh, I think Mohammed bin Salman is, is better off maintaining the status quo. He's enjoying the status of his father as the last king of Abdul Aziz, who is gluing the family together. And, and actually, he, uh, King Salman is the last, uh, or, 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 uh, or the, the last leader of the family. Mm. Uh, so he needs to keep him. And uh, while he consolidates his power for one or two or three more years. Uh, so I just, I think we should rule out all those stories about abdication. I, th I don't think it will happen. But uh, will the family stay united? The family are so disfragmented. Uh, so all those stories about that uh, Mohammed bin Salman had to uh, start this uh, burge on corruption to a preemptive a plan or coup, uh, I, 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 don't, I, I, I don't agree with that. Because I don't anticipate or, or, or I, can, I cannot see the royal family uniting against Mohammed bin Salman, so, or, so weak, so fragmented. We should remember they are from a generation of lavishness, of uh, uh, mo most of their concerns are about uh, the latest expensive watch and the latest uh, uh, trip they had uh, to, 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 to the French Rivera. They are not into politics. They are into exploitation. Uh, and they are fragmented. Uh, they, are, they have envies, jealousies of each other. Uh, there is no leader. Uh, their their, their uh, traditions had been uh, irritated, or, or not irritated, that they had been slipping away from them. Uh, they lost that traditional Al Saud Wahhabi position. They, they have lost it. Uh, an interesting book was published by a royal who is not an HRH. Uh, called Al Mawrut al Saudi by Turkey bin Abdullah bin Abdul Rahman, an excellent book that uh, explains the, dis the, the, the dismantling of the tradition of, uh, of, of the founding uh, ingredients of the, of, of, of the House of Saud. And uh, that book is not in Saudi Arabia, it's not allowed in Saudi Arabia, but it, sh it should be. And I, and I wish MBS would read it because it, it is his legitimacy. Uh, now they are talking about secularism in, in Saudi Arabia. That is the craziest thing that Al Saud do, because the concept of Waliul Amr is what make a king enjoy a divine power to rule. Why would you, as a citizen, I would like him to let, to, to let go of that, and uh, so, so, so he would be more accountable. But why would somebody who enjoys this divine rule 
Give it away. It is, just, it is just like asking Henry VIII to give away that privilege. He wouldn't give it away easily. But if Mohammed bin Salman want to give it away, he's, he's welcome to do so. <laughs> Stanley Kober, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and other Gulf countries have urged their citizens to leave Lebanon. In seven, I'm reminded of 1973, the Soviet diplomats leaving Cairo. Then that was followed by a war. Uh, can we see that request from uh, Gulf citizens to leave uh, Lebanon through the same prism? Well, I think Lebanon is a very dangerous arena to start trying to, if they're trying to stir things up. I don't think there would be a clear-cut resolution in any any way. and. I mean, even now the Israelis have almost acknowledged that they're not willing to, at least yet, to start a conflict or to kind of take action against um, what they see as Hezbollah. On the other hand, perhaps removing Hariri from the scene means it's easier for the Saudi government to, or other Gulf governments to actually say, look, there's uh, even less of a kind of anti-Hezbollah function in Lebanon. and you know, trying to maybe long term say, well, the Lebanese government basically is Hezbollah influenced, even more so than it, than it was, by removing one of the more sort of anti-Hezbollah anti factions. But again, that seems to have backfired, at least at the beginning, where the Lebanese have now kind of rallied around and said, at least come home, and then we can, we can talk about this. So again, I don't think it's produced the results that were necessarily expected two weeks ago, and that could be why there's a degree of sort of backing off by allowing Hariri to, to at least go to France and then potentially back, back to Beirut. OK, Jamal, we have several questions uh, pertaining to Hariri. Um, um, Delinda, Henley, and uh, let me see, Ibtissam, and is it Wasan? Uh, we have I mean, d different questions saying, what's going on with the Hariri? situation in and, and Lebanon, and uh, how will that impact the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Lebanon? It has already impacted the relationship. If, even to our dear uh, Sunnis of Lebanon who always look up to Saudi Arabia for support, for the first time, the Sunnis of Lebanon become critical of Saudi Arabia. That is a true fireback on a hasty decision made by MBS. Yes, he had a good argument for uh, taming down Hezbollah. And I'm sure Saad al-Hariri would have sat with him and developed a plan, a proper plan that could involve the Americans, the French, to counter Hezbollah. But the way it was conducted, the way it was orchestrated, it fired back in Saudi Arabia. And he need to salvage it very quickly, maybe thanks to the French. Now they are in helping us out to salvage the situation. And Hariri will be flying to, uh, to Paris tomorrow with his family. And then hopefully he will go back to Lebanon and re re resume his, law, uh, his role as a leader. Uh, so I think the, the task now for Saudi Arabia is to salvage two things. The Saudi position in Lebanon to restore it again, because we began to lose it, to, to lose uh, our, our influence there, and the, the Al-Hariri family. It took the Sunnis in Lebanon two decades to find a proper leadership to lead. And here we are weakening that leadership. It is important to restore Hariri's credibility in Lebanon, and I, and I hope this is the future plan for MPS, not to weaken the Hariri any, any, uh, anymore by suggesting his brother Baha to be the prime minister or uh, uh, Saad al-Hariri need to be, uh, uh, to be empowered again. It, it is good for Saudi Arabia and also the Saudi uh, position in Lebanon as, uh, what, what is the word? Uh, the, uh, the safeguard for the, at least the Sunni and the Christian community. The, the Iranians have an, an, an exclusivity over the Shias. 
just a couple of uh, follow-up related to Hariri and, and, and Lebanon. Aziz Fahmi was uh, asking if, in addition to the issue of Hezbollah, was Hariri implicated in the other part of the campaign, the corruption issue? And related to that, uh, Mohammed, uh, as always, is asking, uh, was Saudi OJ? Uh, you didn't mention that in, yes. the, in the companies. Was it also implicated? And using the stick of corruption, this magic stick, it can reach Al-Hariri. Al-Hariri and Saudi OJ are as corrupt as Bin Laden or any other, uh, anyone else. But I'm sure his other heart might protect him. But uh, and uh, again, we need transparency. Right now, in the Saudi media is still celebrating in euphoric language uh, the war on corruption by the great leader. But there is no true investigation, investigative journalism. What is the status of Saudi OJ? Is it totally bankrupt? It is totally out of Saudi Arabia? We didn't really, uh, you, you will not find proper reporting about that. Uh, Saudi OJ suffered a great deal before the, 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 the corruption campaign. Uh, but I'm sure it is still there. I'm sure there are uh, there's still issues with, with, with its involvement with royalties. And they were involved with royalties at all fronts. Uh, and he, he, even even King, King Fahad Center for printing uh, the Holy Quran is an example of corruption. That, that, is, that, 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 is, that deserves investigation. You know, a single, the, the cost of a single uh, copy of the Holy Quran from Medina uh, coming from the, uh, for, from the printing house is maybe 10 times if it was printed by anyone else next, next door. So there is an issue to investigate in corruption. So basically, Saad al-Hariri is reachable by the corruption stick. But so far, we haven't heard anything of that sort. And maybe his hat as a prime minister of Lebanon will protect him. So, but it should reach someone else in, uh, within the family or within the company. Uh, Christian Abir Alush asks, uh, from, uh, Abir is from American University, can the magnitude of the recent changes be considered as a moment of transition in terms of an anti-Sahwa new phase in, in Saudi society? Well, I think it's definitely a moment of transition. And we've obviously seen MBS being very vocal about his interpretation of extremist Islam being rejected. And again, like I think with the corruption, it's too much is resting on one man's interpretation. And perhaps there needs to be a wider societal debate and dialogue about this. It's. Um, it's, again, such a top-down, imposed manner that I don't think there's going to be a wide-ranging input from, from groups that clearly will be impacted by some of the changes that are being made. And so if, if there's no debate, it could just breed resentment or, or, or repression even going forward. And I think that's a, that's a mistake. A lot of social debates need to be had, I think. And as Jamal said, kind of this isn't necessarily going about it the, the right way. OK, Jamal, there are several questions regarding uh, kind of issues of succession and governance. Uh, one basically question is, can we infer from the fact that uh, Mohammed bin Salman has no uh, deputy cr or crown prince at, uh, at this time that his sons will be uh, future? I mean, are, are we witnessing Ibn Saud uh, 2.0. Yes, it, it, it is too early to, for that. But again, because of the situation, rumors are spreading. And one of the most interesting rumors I heard recently from uh, an HRH in London uh, that MPS is thinking of downsizing the royal family. This is good news for us, the Saudi people. And it is good for him, because actually the number of the royal family is a burden. It's a burden on the treasure. It is a burden on him. And it is a burden in any future king of Saudi Arabia, because they always have demands, and they will come to him. And they need an administration by themselves to manage their either problems or their needs. Uh, and uh, now the royal families member who have an RH, uh, uh, his RH uh, title, 
are the son of the, grand, uh, of the founder of the kingdom, Abdul Aziz. And then we are talking about five to six thousand uh, grandson of Abdul Aziz, around that number. I don't have the figure, but there is a department at the uh, Ministry of Finance that based a stipend for them who has details of each one of them and has details of their uh, uh, allowances or stipend. Uh, so his plan is to uh, issue a decree to, de to call only the, the, uh, the, the king and his sons as an HRH. So if he become a king, or his father now, so it will be only Al Salman who are B and HRH, and the, and the rest are uh, royal families. Also that, uh, or maybe stripe the whole title from them, uh, Previously, his father used to include other weak or distant member of the family into the family. For example, the new minister for the National Guard, he wasn't a prince 20 years ago. He's from al ayaf and they were not part of the royal family. They were added to the royal family by a decree made by Prince Salman when he was the governor of Riyadh. Prince Salman at that time had an interest to widen the, the circle of the, 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 the royal family. The Al-Farhan also were not part of the family, but now they are part of the family. So it seems that this is the rumor that he will uh, restructure or redefine who is a royal, uh, which maybe will lead him to uh, develop a similar to the British or Jordanian or, or, or Moroccan a style of royal family, and I think this is good. This is good for our budget. It is good. It is good for uh, the public, for the a future uh, uh, new uh, emerging middle class. Royals enjoy privileges, and uh, they have an advantage. If 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 uh, he has a better chance to get a better hospital bed than me, he has a better chance to get uh, way more larger land grant than me. So the less royals we have, the merrier. Uh, I, it's good for Saudi Arabia to do that, and it is good for him. All right, Christian, do you think that uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has exaggerated or given too much credit uh, to the Houthis? Is it really kind of part of the Iran-Saudi competition, or is, is that threat genuine? Well, obviously, the Houthis had already swept out of their traditional strongholds and taken Sana'a by September 2014. And by the time that King Salman came to power, I think it was the same night that he came to power that um, President Hadi was forced into, or I think he was imprisoned temporarily. And so the government fell the same night that uh, Salman came to power. Clearly, the Houthis had an alliance of convenience with Ali Abdullah Saleh, the former president, who had his own interest in destabilizing his successor. I think Yemen is the opposite warning of what happens in a transition state when the former leader is still playing an active political role. Uh, this hasn't happened in any of the other states that went through a regime change as a result of the, the 2011 uprisings. And of course, it they made for a, a very unlikely pair of um, partners, given the, the series of wars that had been fought by the Yemeni government with the Houthis between 2004 and 2010. I think maybe there was an overreaction in terms of imagining this to be another sort of front organization. But as with the missile that we saw two weeks ago, that kind of has become a self-fulfilling prophecy as it's created the conditions for the breakdown of authority and control that has allowed Iran and Iranian groups or backed groups to, to gain influence. And so kind of the situation is now basically as if the one that they had been saying in 2015, that this is another front. Um, what I would say is that you know, trying to take on the Iranians with proxy groups is not necessarily I mean, the Iranians have a 40-year practice of working with groups like Hezbollah, and this is a dangerous, um, I mean, they're experts in how they do that. And I think in Yemen and also in Syria, it's been shown that uh, they can maintain levels of direct and indirect influence that has far outmatched at least the Sunni Arab state's ability to do the same. And that's going to be a problem in every regional conflict, uh, I think, going forward. 
Jamal, uh, Michael Hudson would like to know a little bit more about the background, education-wise, and how did that shape uh, Mohammed bin Salman's worldview? Uh, where does he get his advice? Uh, I was surprised to learn yesterday from a friend of mine who teach in an American university that he advised Mohammed bin Salman. So that, 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 that was good news for me, that he does reach out to proper advisor. But the same friend said to me, but what make me angry, he doesn't listen to my advice. <laughs> <laughs> he just gets it. <laughs> and he has the best advisor when it comes to uh, development and uh, ch changing the face of Saudi Arabia. He, he, he spent mil billions uh, of dollars uh, on uh, those uh, consultant, cons cons consultants. Mm -hmm. So he has no problem with advisors. He could have benefited from Prince Turkel Faisal, who's an an excellent expertise of foreign policy, but he doesn't. Uh, he does need proper advisors, because if he look back at the decision, at, at decisions he made, he will realize that they did not uh, evolve into his likeness. They were, it, it is, if it's not failure, it is stagnation, like the Yemen situation. But we also failed in Syria, we also failed in, we are failing now in Yemen, in, 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 in Lebanon, but one can argue about that. He, he needs to revise either his advisor or his strategy. There is need to that. And uh, there is also a need, maybe, maybe there's a bad, we did not, maybe there will be a question about this. It is what I call the Trump effect. Trump, I think, had been a negative imp, uh, influence on Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, he gave him the wrong premises or a false premises that he can support him to change the Middle East, that he can support him to oust the Iranians out of Syria and out of Iraq. But again, Mohammed bin Salman should have an advisor who would tell him that even Trump is sincere in his promise, he cannot deliver because the United States is gigantic. Uh, it, uh, f for Trump to get involved uh, against the Iranians in Syria, he need to get the concession, the, 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 the consensus, the understanding from the Pentagon, from the, the Congress to do such a thing. So he should know that uh, whatever Jared Kushner and Trump promise, they cannot uh, deliver. Uh, but we need to spend some time about uh, the Trump effect on MBS and, uh, and and how it and how is that is not uh, is destabilizing the, the, the Middle East. Uh, United States also need to speak in one voice, not tr uh, dual voices, uh, so that will send the wrong message to uh, a leader like Mohammed bin Salman, uh, listening to Trump and listening to Tillerson and assuming that there is a difference between them, uh, but. Basically, the U.S. can play a very major positive role in impacting things in Saudi Arabia because they are the only one who have kind of a leverage on uh, Saudi Arabia today. I do think the biggest miscalculation that he made was to assume that if Trump swung, the U.S. government would swing with him. And perhaps it does go back to the fact that maybe there was a, an over-expectation or a sense that the personalization of decision making in the US government, at least in its first year in office, offered an opportunity. And I think maybe more calmer advice or kind of decision making might have cautioned otherwise. But I think that is the key miscalculation that was made. All right. Uh, the next question is from Andrew Graves, Department of Energy. Uh, addressed to both of you, uh, how do you see the pace of economic reforms unfolding, uh, specifically in terms of the reduction in subsidies uh, for the uh, domestic gas and electricity prices and so on? Well, I think so far some of the initial measures have been either watered down or even uh, put off. And I think one benefit if he's serious about 
going through with a lot of the painful measures that inevitably will have to be part of Vision 2030 is if he can now show through his actions over the past two weeks that he's serious about this and actually is not going to brook any discontent. Because I think over the past two years, at the first sign of a public backlash, the, you know, the government has, to some extent, changed course. And I think the trade-offs involved in transitioning the Saudi economy to a more sustainable long-term economic structure, not just with reduction in subsidies, but also clearly labor market reform and creating those jobs that young Saudis will move into, not foreign workers, is going to involve taking on those vested economic interests that have a, a vested interest in maintaining the advantages they have. And so if those vested interests are now thinking, well, actually, he's taking on key elements that are going to resist some of the changes, then he could have a chance to succeed. But I mean, that's going to be the main thing, creating those jobs that can really show a trickle-down effect and that can actually make the vision a reality for, for young Saudis. One of the high expectations he promised us is to have a more transparent budget. And we need to see more of that. Because now with all those discussions about uh, uh, the purge on corruption, with the aim, according to the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal, that is to uh, gain some of the wealth of the corrupt and add it to the national treasury, that shows a, a, a negative sign to the status of the national treasury, that it needs to take money from the corrupt to add to the national treasury. So what is the true situation in, the, in, in, in our reserve and the, and the national treasury? Uh, there is a reluctancy that is influenced by politics when it comes to uh, stopping subsidies or uh, 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 allowances to government employees. Uh, he uh, ordered back the allowances that they were scrapped from uh, uh, government employees. And I think that there were two drivers to that, politics and the other driver, the effect on, uh, on, 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 the, private, on, on the local market. Uh, Saudi Arabia is going through a recession uh, because of that. And, um, but the recession is, is maybe now will be reinforced with the verge on corruption. But the things I like, uh, and the government is still doing that it's uh, it, 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 the drive against uh, tasattur, against uh, 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 illegal businesses, for illegal foreign businesses in Saudi Arabia who are doing uh, who are working under a cover up by a Saudi Arabian is a major crisis uh, epidemic that affecting our uh, national economy. That a huge number of businesses are operated in Saudi Arabia by foreigners who own it, who manage it, who op operate it, but it is in the name of Saudis. So I began to see pictures of uh, the souk in Riyadh or in Abha shut down. This, even though it's a, a sign of recession, but it is good because we because those. Those businesses are not contributing to the national budget, to the national economy. And they need to uh, let go off so the Saudis will go back to the culture of work. So this is continuing. And I hope it will continue. But there is a great deal of reluctancy in, on, 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 on the plans altogether. All right. Uh, Warren David asks uh, a question regarding the uh, Saudi perspective vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran. Uh, uh, Christian, uh, is the so-called Iranian expansionism uh, that Jamal referred to earlier, is it really a genuine uh, threat? And uh, why, yes, isn't, is. wh <laughs> why isn't Mohammed bin Salman promoting uh, more diplomatic rather than interventionist or military uh, confrontational uh, policy in this regard? I think the threat from Iran is magnified by the fact that all around Saudi Arabia there are conflicts involving state and non-state actors that clearly Iran has been involved in and, to be honest, has a lot more 
um, ability to use for their own ends. And you know, these aren't conventional conflicts, but they're conflicts using the resources, the tools that Iran has developed for, for, for decades. And as I said earlier, I mean, both in Syria and now in Yemen, you know, taking on Iran on in terms of trying to outsmart it with your own proxies is is a difficult task when your your foe has been doing this expertly for for years. And so I think that's the challenge that they face. I think also the um, you know, the creations of state failure over the past seven years, because it's been almost seven years now of turmoil on almost every regional front, you know, has really resulted in, in, in an expansion of the opportunities available to Iran to project itself into regional affairs. Um, going back almost 15 years, if you talk about the occupation of Iraq after 2003. And so, you know, this is a, a kind of a fast moving situation which has clearly created those pathways that have been filled by Iran and by their groups. I think the defeat of ISIS in northern Iraq and in Syria, while obviously very welcome, is potentially another deeply concerning element if you're looking at, at it from an anti-Iranian point of view, because I think a lot of the uh, spaces that could be filled could also now link up a lot of those Iranian groups across the region in a contiguous way. <clears throat> And I think that would be a, another key concern to, to watch. Okay, Jamal, uh, John Anderson would like to know what percentage of the Saudi budget outlay goes to stipends, allowances, to princes, royal family members? Do you have any idea? No, 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 no nobody knows. Uh, it is not a public knowledge, uh, which will not be listed in any future budget, maybe in the future, but no, I don't know. The only figure I know and I heard it from a prince who is a grandson of the king. So then you can do a calculation that he receives 130,000 riyals a month. Uh, so his father will receive double that. His children will receive less of that. And the girls will take half. You do your calculation if you know the number of royalties. <laughs> which is from first hand from an, a prince. This one hundred and thirty is, you can use it as a base for your calculation. All right, Wasim uh, asks uh, Jamal uh, to comment on uh, the major reason for Ben Salman's campaign at, the, at this time. Uh, is it to have a deeper monarchy? Uh, is this like uh, to create a more convenient regime? I don't know what are his true motives, but if we are suggesting that he's doing that for him to buff his way to power, he doesn't need to. He's already on the throne. He doesn't need to. He doesn't need to arrest Mut ibn Abdullah to, uh, to become a king of Saudi Arabia because he's already the de facto king of Saudi Arabia. But did that enforce his position? Yes, it did enforce his position now as much as, as he has intimidated us, the people of Saudi Arabia, that most of us are afraid to speak out freely in the media because we know a cousin or a friend or an associate who is arrested. Now the royals are as intimidated as us. Is that useful for uh, him to enjoy uh, total authority? I don't know. It, he, 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 he can answer that, but I don't think he needs to intimidate us, nor the royals, to, to rule, because he's, there is, really, there is no challenge, no power that could challenge him or stop him from becoming a king of Saudi Arabia. He is using the most powerful power. It is the absolute monarchy, Waliul Amr uh, power. Uh, and that is enough power uh, that any, if, if it wasn't uh, King Salman, as if, if Mugrin was today the king of Saudi Arabia, his son will enjoy the same power. If Ahmed bin Abdul Aziz did not step out of the race and he become the crown prince or the king of Saudi Arabia, his son would have enjoyed the same power. So the power, yes, Mohammed bin Salman is smart. He's, I mean, he, he outperformed everybody. He has his own personal there are personal merits in, in him, we should not rule out. Abdul Aziz bin Fahad 
was in the same position, but he wasn't really as smart as Mohammed bin Salman. So we should give him credit for being smart. And now he has to, to, uh, to perform as a leader in economic and in, uh, and, and in foreign policy. But uh, his, his most impor uh, important source of power is this concept of wilayat al-amr. Uh, and, and it's plenty of power. It's an absolute monarchy uh, source of power. Maybe you can explain it better, Christian, this, this Wilayat al-Amr concept. Well, no, I mean, I think if you start to tinker with these traditional sources of power, authority, and legitimacy, you're opening up a, a kind of worms that you might not want to open up. And so, especially at the same time that you're engaged in such a wide-ranging attempt to reformulate the economic and perhaps even the sort of socio-religious aspects of society. Um, there's a danger, perhaps, of being spread too thin, um, even without all the foreign policy issues going on, and try to do too much too fast. And you know, to what extent is there the bandwidth to, to try to take on every front at the same time? That would be another concern I would have, perhaps, going forward. Yeah, I, I think this uh, remark probably answers uh, Jeff Wiley's question. Jeff is with the State Department. In terms of how all these steps taken uh, over the past uh, several weeks uh, will impact the relationship between the Saudi monarchy and the fundamentalist religious uh, establishment? The fundamentalist religious establishment, they are on the payroll of the government. Uh, when Mohammed bin Salman says that he wants to destroy radicalism, he should have said, I'm going to unplug radicalism. Radicalism would not have flourished in Saudi Arabia if it wasn't for government support. All what he needs to do is just unplug it. Those uh, radicals who were empowered in putting uh, their radicalism into our textbook by the government, they did not win an election and they, sh and, 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 and they shared power with the, with the, with the Al Saud. They were empowered by them for a certain period of time. Now, the, the, uh, the, the, the prince or the kingdom uh, realize that they are a burden on, uh, on it. So they are just unplugging their support and blaming the Ikhwan for it. Actually, the radicals are not the Ikhwan. The radicals are the, the Wahhabi infrastructure that is surrounding the government. And still, until today, the senior council of ulama is infested with radical, with, 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 with ulama with radical views. Radical views about the Shias, radical views about women's rights, radical views. Can, can, uh, it will be useful to do a paper about the political thinking or the social thinking of Sheikh, of Sheikh Salah al Luhaydan or our Grand Mufti or, uh, or, or Salah al Fuzan and, 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 and address their views about. Uh, minorities, about relation to non-Muslims, about their uh, uh, diversities, how do they see other Muslim sects, and then you will judge who is truly radicals. I was annoyed by one uh, a Saudi uh, who was uh, uh, talking on a, on a TV program a few days ago and uh, made notice that Prince Mohammed bin Salman is ar arresting the clergy who could stop his reform. It is not true. The clergy who are arrested, 90% of them, they are for reform. Whether about democracy, whether about women driving. Abdullah al-Maliki, who was arrested uh, last September, he even called to remove male guardianship right on, 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 on females in Saudi Arabia. This is one of the most sensitive issues in Saudi Arabia, to remove male guardianship on, 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 on women. Abdullah al-Malki, who's arrested and being accused as being radical, wrote an essay about that. None of the, none of the clergy in the senior council of ulama would dare write a similar essay. And they are the ones who are being patroned and being uh, respected by the authority today. The, the, the true reformers today in Saudi Arabia are in jail. Yes. All right. Abdullah uh, al-Maliki. We're going to conclude with our time's up. Uh, the last question I will entertain is from uh, John Duke Anthony. Uh, one minute each. 
Um, how do you see uh, the near or long-term uh, future of the GCC as a result of all of this? Unless, we, uh, unless the Qatari crisis is resolved, the Kuwaitis are also anxious and worried the GCC will be on a freeze. And that will, with, and if the summit will not be held this, year, this December, with all its, uh, with all the, the six members, uh, we might lose the GCC. I think it's a great shame if the summit doesn't take place in Kuwait, because Kuwait has been the leading regional mediator, and it would be an opportunity to at least get everyone in the room. I think we've seen in the past in the region institutions don't necessarily get dissolved. They just become irrelevant and marginalized. And I suspect that the GCC will remain on paper, with or without Qatar. But we've seen at every stage of this crisis, every major decision has been taken, has been bypassing the GCC. And I think that will just continue. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our event today. Please join me in thanking both speakers for their excellent presentations. And thank you for being here. We look forward to seeing you in future events. Thanks.